Welcome, everybody. So today's session is what I call the great E911 debate. E911 is a problem for enterprise PBXs. As we become more fluid and mobile, 911 becomes more and more difficult to understand and implement. So what I've done is I've brought together the leading 911 vendors and their solutions together. We actually did this a little bit uh, last year in Newport at the regional show. And we had some great comments. This was an extremely helpful session. I now have a whole new outlook on E911. Finally, I understand how all of this works. And we were about to go down the wrong path. And most importantly, cool, they're keeping the bar open late. Obviously, people know Sean from AAA. So what we've done is we've we worked out the kinks uh, last fall. And uh, I think this is a really beneficial session because 911 can de be deployed in many different ways. Every enterprise is actually unique. And there are different methodologies that can be applied. And there is no one right way. There may be some wrong ways. <laughs> But that's dependent on your enterprise environment. So the biggest thing I think you need to do as an administrator is understand what's available. And you need to understand what can be done with 911. And then decide after meeting with your public safety people, your internal risk management, and even the PSAPs, the 911 centers, what works best for your particular environment. So I'd like to introduce the panel for today. Bill Sveen is Vice President of Corporate Strategy at 911 ETC. Bill's responsible for overseeing daily operations and for driving company growth. He possesses an extensive background in telecommunications and is recognized as an expert on E911. He's an active member in the Next Gen 911 Institute, ICERT, and NINA, and has spoken on the topic of E911 for several people, several audiences, including Enterprise Connect, National Avaya Conference, ACUDA, and Comptel. Bill? <clears throat> Next, we have Lev Deitch from 911 Enable. Lev's been a part of 911 Enable since 2005, where he currently serves as a director and is deeply involved with the design, development, and advancement of E911 and 911 Enable's award winning solution. Lev's helped uh, position E911 Enable as the industry leader in E911 for IP telephony and continues to work closely with customers, industry associations, and E911 colleagues to define the E911 challenging challenges facing communications networks today and develop new E911 standards and norms and create solutions that meet these requirements. Lev, thanks for coming down today. Thank you. Tim Kenyon with Conveyant Systems. Tim's been uh, tw got 25 years experience in the telecom industry. He's president of Conveyance Systems and has played a significant role in the definition of attendant console applications and most recently in the development of affordable NINA 911 solutions for the enterprise market. He is also an active member of NINA and recently added, added the emergency number professional or ENP certification to his resume. His participation includes the next gen 911 additional data work group that's defining architectural structure for enterprise information being sent to public safety. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for coming. And Nick Mayer, who's a senior executive with over 15 years telecom marketing, product development, and channel development. In his current role, Mr. Mayer is responsible for Red Sky's strategic channel relationships with OEM voice over IP platform providers and resellers. Nick has been involved in the E911 market for the past 10 years during the transition from TDM to H323, SIP, and now Cloud E911. He previously served as the co-chairman of the Avaya DevConnect Advisory Council and is, an active in the develop, and is active in the developer programs of most major OEMs. Nick, thanks for coming out today. I'm your moderator. I'm Mark Fletcher, the product line manager for uh, emergency services at, at Avaya. My goal and strategy is to make sure Avaya is represented within the E911 industry. 
on our enterprise product set in making 911 calls. Within the network, where the 911 calls are processed, both in the legacy environment and now in the next generation environment. And we also, our product is used in the 911 center itself. 911 centers are just large call taking applications for a very critical application. But as next generation 911 becomes more and more prevalent in the centers, it's all about looking at the contextual data that's wrapped around the 911 call. Today, it's very much just a phone number and a screen pop of an address. In the future, next generation 911 networks will pass multimedia, video, pictures, email, and all kinds of contextual data that'll be available. And it's important that we examine that data to get the person who needs help to the call taker that can provide help as quickly as possible. The enterprise environment has been learning about how to flatten, consolidate, and extend their enterprise and to utilize that environment for significant cost savings. Public safety today is probably one of the worst hit in industries from a financial perspective. 911 funds at the state level constantly get raided and the people who are there who need to save our lives are really scraping off the bottom of the barrel. Next generation 911 will help them also realize the benefits of next generation and uh, regular networks that are next generation to flatten, consolidate, move to that data center environment that lets them do their job better and at a more efficient, uh, efficient price point. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of questions. We're going to go down the line, starting at the, uh, the far end and work our way this way. The individual will have uh, two minutes to uh, respond to that. And then the others will have an opportunity to respond to that. So we're looking for today not to be adversarial. We're looking for today to be informative so that you can make a fair comparison of what technologies would apply to your business and how those technologies could be used to solve your problems. I think one of the biggest challenges we had last time was timing. So I am getting my timer set here. There we go. So the first question is for Bill. What's the square root of 39? No. <laughs> OK, well, you know what? Uh, <laughs> what I don't do know you, that answer. Okay, I good. don't know that answer. So what do you see as the primary challenge of the PBX administrator when implementing an E911 solution in an enterprise uh, PBX? Well, the, it, considering the fact that there's so many different uh, departments involved in E911 and in an, in an enterprise uh, environment, it's really the primary challenge, I think, is actually pulling together all of the different departments that E911 will actually impact. I'm thinking about the human resources, I'm thinking about IT, I'm thinking about a number of different other departments, security, and actually getting a team formed to the point where you actually get a consensus among the enterprise and the, the organization so that when you actually do come to a solution, you've got buy-in from everybody. So when we look at that, that's really the primary beginning point of implementing an E911 solution. When you step back from that, you really need to also identify the technology and how you want to approach that. Um, and it, as an administrator, there's, a, uh, there's just so many different things that you need to do in order to keep the ship afloat. Well, to add another application or responsibility and possibly even a liability to your, oh, I thought that was the beep. No. Uh, a liability to your department uh, the whole idea of should you take it on as a responsibility by bringing it in-house or should you actually farm it out somewhere else? So you involve a third party, a third party provider, a service provider, so that you can actually offload much of that, that ongoing support uh, as well as the implementation uh, during that first initial phase of, of implementing the 911 solution. So, bringing in an administrator to help with that process, 
of formulating the E911 solution, uh, implementing and testing is really, real, it, I think it's really critical. And we've been doing that since really 1997. Right, thanks very much, appreciate that. So Lev, you wanna to respond to that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, basically, from our perspective, from our experience, what we really see as a primary challenge is data collection. So you've touched a bit on that, that it does imply interacting with different teams. Uh, what we've seen a lot of is the data spread out in different environments, different groups, and you need to have a centralized um, platform or authoritative place to maintain all this data. And that's what 911 is all about. That's what most of these 911 solutions are focusing on, is trying to centralize this data, have one authoritative place, rather than having many dispersed databases, one for analog phones, one for digital phones, one for IP phones, having scripts do all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, we've seen solutions out there where people are using old equipment, old, old databases, uh, they're using scripts to put things together, and as soon as one, something changes in that environment, the whole 911 solution falls apart like, like a house of cards. So the key is to have something that's robust, that's able to maintain all your data, and also able to adapt to your environment as it changes. It's not just that data that you collect at the beginning of the project changes over time. You need to have processes in place, you need to have a solution in place that makes it easy to capture these changes, to automate as much as possible, and that's what the key element of any 911 solution is all about, is to centralize the data and automate as many of those tasks as possible. Great, thanks very much. Nick. Uh, two quick points. Um, Bill, to your point about building support for uh, E911 in your organization, you know, that's a very important organizational thing that you as an administrator will have to undertake. Like there's lots of uh, organizations in your enterprise that are going to be affected by E911, starting with, you know, your corporate counsel, your risk management organization, your public safety organization, your IT department. So it's very important that you are able to build support within that, uh, within your own enterprise community, to move forward an E911 project. So we have a white paper on our website, Red Sky. Uh, e911.com that tells you how to go through a process of building support with all these other organizations and who you can bring to bear. Um, so that would be a useful resource. Now, the other thing I think that people need to think about is you know, as, as, we move, as we have moved to IP and now SIP, it's important to start thinking about your database in terms of the network, in terms of the data network, in terms of network regions, layer two, uh, ports and locations that are associated with your network rather than a physical location that's loaded into your PBX. You have to start thinking like data people and how, how your data network is laid out is to a great degree going to determine uh, your location nomenclature strategy and how you are going to find people. Great, thanks very much. Tim, last comments? Yeah, um, the question was, you know, the primary challenge of the PBX administrator when it comes to 911, and uh, in my opinion, I think, you know, the primary challenge is understanding what your needs are. What are the requirements for your enterprise? What are the requirements um, legislatively in the state, you know, that you're, uh, you have operations in? You need to have a greater understanding of what E911 means to you and your environment and uh, your enterprise. Once you have an understanding of what the needs are, what the requirements are, uh, then all of these things come into play, making sure that you build the right team, making sure that you understand where the data is coming from and how to collect that effectively, and you know, how, to, uh, how to make all of this come together you know, uh, to, to, to provide you the solution and the answers and the, um, basically what you're looking for in 911. But you have to understand what your requirements are. You have to understand the technology that is available to you, and you have to really get a grip on it. You have to be educated. Um, about what the capabilities and the technical um, uh, fun, you know, specifications are of the products that are available to you. And then you can make an intelligent decision to go from there. Okay, great, thanks very much. Lev, what is your view of existing legislation for MLTS, and that's multi-line telephone system? 
in the 17 states that have legislation? And how would you propose any change to any deficiencies that you see? Right. I think that's a great question. A lot of customers use this legislation as one of their sources of requirements. And some of the legislation is drafted better than others. Some of it is very clear. It talks about square footage, how granular you need to be in terms of locations, what your callback number information should look like, and so on. And other states, unfortunately, have very vague language. Sometimes it's unclear um, and makes it a little bit difficult for some of the enterprises to actually follow the reg regulations um, to the letter because it can be interpreted in different ways. Um, so that, I think that's, what's, that's the big challenge with some of the regulations. Um, how would we can improve it? Well, I think one of the challenges is that they, because they vary at the state level and networks span multiple jurisdictions these days, a lot of enterprises say, well, how granular do I need to be in my different offices? Should I follow the strictest? Should I follow the least strict? Should I follow based on site? And it's really not clear um, at the national level what that should look like. I know uh, NINA, the National Emergency Numbering Association, did propose some model legislation that talks about um, square footage and some of the requirements. And obviously, the states are looking at that as a model legislation. But unfortunately, it's still not implemented at the federal level. Um, so, so the states should really be a little bit clearer on their language um, in terms of regulations. And obviously, the ideal scenario would be to have something that's consistent across the board, across all states. Um, so that enterprise wouldn't have this issue about how granular you need to be in the different locations uh, where the users are located at. Great. Thanks very much. Nick. Legislation is the most important driver of an enterprise looking at E911. And um, we know this because we track every visitor that comes to our website and by far consistently over the past 10 years, the legislation portion of our website is the most visited, people spend the most time there. Um, so enterprises really are concerned about are we in compliance with the law? Um, and again, back to the point of building support for your E911 project, uh, this would be of high interest to risk management or your corporate compliance department uh, because they are going to be responsible for meeting the regulations in a particular state. Uh, second point, um, most large enterprise customers have operations in, in more than one of those 17 states. So a typical approach that we have seen with large enterprises that are implementing E911 is to say, do a phase one where they're going to get compliant in each one of those 17 states where they're located. And then what happens is the corporate compliance department gets involved and says, well, you can't just provide E911 to people in the states that have regulations. You have to provide E911 to all of our employees. So that's typically what happens is they'll do the states that they're required to first and then they'll begin to roll it out to all of their employees in all of their locations. Great, thanks very much. Tim. Uh, I think some of the newer legislation that we've seen coming out, especially uh, like that that came out here in Massachusetts, is uh, definitely following the NINA model. And we're getting to a better definition of the legislation that's being proposed on a state-by-state -state basis. And I think it's important. Um, we've seen some very weak legislation. You must allow the user to be able to dial 911 on the phone. Uh, it doesn't provide you anything more than that. We should all be able to expect to pick up a phone and push the digits 911 and actually go where we're supposed to go. Um, I, I certainly think that there are uh, some improvements that need to be made in some of the existing legislation that exists in some of those 17 states in order to get up to a model that's uh, uh, sustainable and uh, supportable by the enterprise. And, I, uh, and to get to that level of um, granularity if need be, you know, that might be defined in some of the legislation, so I definitely think there's uh, an important role there. Um, in my, my personal opinion, though, is that I really think that the enterprises need to look above and beyond the legislation and just trying to get compliant and just trying to meet the letter of the law to protect themselves. You know, I think that they're at a much higher risk of not doing anything even if the state doesn't require uh, certain levels of uh, compliancy, you know, for 911, in the fact that they're putting their people in danger if they don't address this. 
Um, technology is available. Technology uh, is affordable for 911. Um, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be expensive. I think it needs to, you know, be sat down with the uh, uh, people within the enterprise, and they need to find what their goals are again. You know, for the people within their organization and what they are trying to do. What are they trying to accomplish? At a minimum, they need to meet the specifications of the toughest state that they may have uh, locations at, as a minimum, and then apply that broadly across the entire um, corporate structure, you know, uh, on a national level. But again, I think it's more important that, you know, you look at what are you doing to protect your people, your employees, your visitors, anybody that's in your facility, first and foremost, right. and go from there. Thanks very much. Oops. Go back one there. Mr. Sveen, I forgot you on the end. I apologize. No, that's okay. I still remember the question. Uh, I, we really like, at ETC, we really like the, the NINA model legislation because it really takes into account um, many different facets of the E911 solution, especially in the enterprise space. Um, you got to look at what's needed on the enterprise level, what kind of granularity you need within the enterprise space. You got to look at what the PSAP operators need. Where do they need to dispatch to? Do they need to dispatch to a cube um, on 15th floor? Or actually, are they dispatching to an address at a meet me, at a meet me address or a meet me uh, door location? You know, what kind of information will make this happen so that those that need to respond are actually getting to the victim as quickly as possible? And so I really like the NINA model legislation because it is 7,000 square feet. It's a pretty good uh, square footage measurement um, with uh, an enhancement of on-site notification either through uh, crisis alert or ESA within the PBX or in our case we'd add Sentry products or the Sentry solution to add enhanced 911 uh, emergency no notification on-site. But that 7,000 square foot gets dispatch information to those that need to get there, properly to the address, most likely to the door, and more than likely to the floor. So I really like that, or we really like that at ETC. And with IP, as well as the, the mobility, as, uh, as people move about from building to building, floor to floor, it's really self-administered moves. You really need to get, get the location identification down to an Elan Earl pair or a subnet location. And so, again, if you look at that model le legislation, it's really written around that whole idea of the technology to keep it simple on your side for database management, but also to take care of what needs to be done, which is dispatched to the, to the victim. Great. Well, Thanks very much, Bill. Ah. <laughs> and the secret bag of money is <laughs> FCC, come on. The third question. Nick, describe your strategy for next generation 911 products within the enterprise and what value add your company brings to the table. Well, in, in terms of next generation 911 products, we have a separate product group that we formed about three years ago uh, called the Public Safety Group. So this group has been active in uh, developing virtually all the components that are required in a next generation 911 architecture so that you can build an emergency services network that's built on SIP and transmit the video and the text and, and whatnot. So we've done patent work in that area. We've developed multiple products. Uh, we're testing them in certain beta um, uh, sites right now. But m more so than that, I think one of the, one of the most important things that's happening now, and you'll see it at this conference, is the fact that all applications are moving to the cloud. And I'm going to go on a limb here and say that within five years, I think we're going to see probably half of the enterprise PBXs that are out there today are going to be in the cloud. And the reason that I say that is because of the costs and the mobility that are afforded by SIP-based platforms are going to make running your PBX in the cloud more efficient for you, more cost-effective for you, and give you more capability. 
So that's one of the reasons that we're announcing at this conference here that we're moving our e one manager application, which has traditionally been a premise-based application, we're moving that to the cloud. So it's now available in the cloud, and you can buy e one one on e one manager on a per phone, per month basis. So rather than CapEx, it's now OpEx. Um, so those are, the, uh, th those are the directions that I see next gen moving. Thanks very much, Nick. Tim. I think the, the key to next gen 911 is, is data, uh, making sure that the, uh, uh, all the elements that you know, your public safety, your first responders are gonna need are available to them when they receive a call, uh, whether that be floor plans to building, whether that be video links, uh, whether that be um, uh, you know, chemical sensors, temperature sensors, there's a lot of data you know, that uh, our first responders would like to have as they're rolling up to an event. Conveyant for 25 years has been in the business of collecting data and gathering data and location information, you know, starting with our directory applications for many years. We jumped into the 911 piece at the uh, behest of one of our larger federal government clients, and um, we found a way to automate the process of gathering information on a very timely basis so we can pinpoint the location of a caller in a very large uh, structured environment. I think that making uh, data available and making it affordable to get to the data and being able to provide that information to 911 when a call is made, whether that be by pushing the location information to a SIP header in the future, making links available in the SIP headers uh, that they can uh, come back to and get to that data, maybe within the enterprise, uh, putting in an lo emergency location management application, an ELM server within the DMZ and the customer site, and allow the PSAPs to be able to uh, go back into that uh, Elm server and be able to pull the information that they need in order to be able to properly respond. And that's really our goal is to make sure that we're making uh, access to the customer's data available easily, uh, affordably, and making it available to the first responders, you know, in any case. I, I agree with uh, Nick that I think that there is a, a, a quite a large percentage of the PBXs today that are going to end up in a cloud environment whether that's being through hosted providers of uh, cloud PBX offerings or if that is the enterprise themselves you know, being their own cloud product. And uh, we're able to provide that capability to them today, and we have right. those components in place now. Thanks very much. Bill. Okay. Your uh, vision. Next generation. Where we're at right now in the network, it's in the transition right now. The PSTN is in transition. So, you know, going from TDM to next generation is not just a blink of an eye. So through uh, Nina recommendations, through build outs of, of uh, carrier, carrier service providers, there's a process that's taking place where E911 is actually moving through a series of steps. I1 was where uh, Vonage was able to act, direct a call at least to PSAP on administration line. Now we're in, in the majority of the country, we're in I2, which gives us the ability to redirect calls from a disparate location back to a, uh, a PSAP location that's, that should be service, serving that remote location. So as uh, enterprise uh, clients and even small savings and loans for that matter, I mean, we've, we've got clients that are just spread out through a city and it happens to be at a PSAP boundary location where one particular location is you know, outside that one main uh, service area. You've got to come up with a plan of attack, so the I2 uh, uh, network system actually provides a, a redirection for that 911 call right back to the correct PSAP. So next generation is a network thing. As Tim had mentioned, it's an enterprise thing. And so what we are doing as ETC is we're providing that glue that gives the, uh, gives the enterprise the opportunity to transition from TDM to I2 to next generation in a very seamless transitional f uh, way in order to allow you to move from where you are right now to next generation in a very cost effective and a very systematic way of moving. Um, when we look at the cloud, and Nick had mentioned the cloud and uh, how uh, hosted solutions that's it. could. Sorry, Bill. Oh. I apologize. No, that's okay. Lev. Right. Um, 911 enabled strategy for next generation really is all about making it 
transparent to the end users, whether you're an enterprise, whether you're a carrier service provider. The transition is going to happen in the back end. The key is to make sure that whatever you have in place today doesn't need to be overhauled and taken out just because one of your sites, the PSAP, just upgraded to NG911. So our strategy is to make it seamless. Our entire architecture is actually built on NG911 standards. We're able to store location objects in the same format that the NG911 format specifies. In fact, it's compatible even in Europe with the ENA standards. So that means that any location that we store, that we process, is already NG911 formatted. 80% uh, of our customers use SIP trunking to deliver their 911 calls to our hosted platform services. We have a, a 911 cloud service that takes your 911 call from your main data centers and directs it to the right PSAP, the correct PSAP, based on the caller's location. You're using SIP today. If you're using SIP today with our solutions, the migration to NG911 will be transparent. And regarding um, the comment we talked about, the cloud services, as PBX is moving to the cloud, I agree with Nick's assessment. Um, everything, a lot of things are moving to the cloud. Some of the, smaller, some of the smaller PBXs are going to be in the cloud. That's why from day one, we've been working with tier one, tier two, and tier three service providers and carriers, providing 911 services from the cloud, from their data centers. Um, that's today, we're running a quarter million 911 calls through our cloud-based services. And that's, 80% of it is uh, with customers that are using SIP trunking on the enterprise space, as well as the hosted providers doing SIP trunking, offering hosted PBX services. So that's something that's, uh, that's a key, and uh, we're, we're there to provide those services. Great, thanks very much. The fourth question, what single feature do you see as the most critical for an enterprise E911 deployment. Tim? Emergency on-site notification, hands down. You know, without, without any flinching on that, you, we need to notify people on-site that someone in your environment has dialed 911. It may take four to 11 to 15 minutes for emergency vehicles to respond to your location when somebody dials 911. Um, there's nothing scarier, and you should know this, <laughs> than being the one on the ground you know, uh, not knowing how much longer you're going to be able to hold your breath, not knowing if someone has heard you, not knowing whether someone is going to be there for you or not. And in my personal opinion, um, you, you need to provide, somebody needs to be there. Somebody needs to be notified that an event has happened, that somebody has dialed 911, and that somebody is going to be there and respond and make sure that individual knows that help is on the way. You know, remove some of the panic, remove some of the stress, remove some of the shock while the professionals are on route, you know, to get to that individual. So being able to have a uh, robust on-site notification solution, being able to provide detailed location information about where that individual was when they picked up that phone and dialed 911 is critical. We're going to be able to get the public safety people to the building. We're going to be able to get them to the floor. And as long as the on-site first responders know that um, uh, know of the event and have been notified of the event, they're going to be able to unlock the door, clear the way, and get those uh, public safety people to that victim as quickly as possible. So, you know, hands down, on-site notification is, you know, key in any 911 deployment, period. Great. Thanks very much. Bill. Uh, just to uh, piggyback off of what Tim had mentioned, on-site notification is absolutely critical. Uh, obviously, IP discovery is also important in this mobile, in, uh, the, the mobile environment that we have right now with IP and the ability to move from one place to another. But really, I, I, I set the technologies aside for a minute with this question, and basically, I, I look at more of, a, of an implementation portion of it. If you're gonna have a uh, 911 solution in place, you really need to have project management, implementation, testing, and an ongoing support, and solu uh, uh, support to that solution. So we look at the technologies, and they all should work, right? Uh, but when it really gets down to it, the solution has to be backed up by humans. So in the implementation phase, in all of this process from start to finish to the point where it should be running on all eight cylinders, y you really need to have a support mechanism in place to make sure that that 911 solution is not a, a, an application that wakes you up at, in a dead, uh, out of a dead you know, sleep 
with sweat, just no, just wondering whether or not, oh my gosh, gosh, is it gonna, is this gonna, is this really uh, in 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 good shape? So, when it comes down to cloud and hosted solution providers, uh, we've been doing this since 1997. We've got the methodologies in place. We've got the business model in place. We've got data centers in place. We've got the people, the humans that actually take error calls, that take error support calls, that actually help you when it gets down to that ongoing support issue. So I believe that that's, that's what really makes it uh, the, the most important feature that we have to offer. And we call it PITS, P-I-T-S, which is Project Management Implementation Testing and Support, a new acronym. Thanks, Bill. Lev. Um, you know, this is a tough question, and the reason why is we deal with a wide range of customers, and you can't say there's one feature that's more important than others. Every customer is different. It can vary from site to site. On-site security is definitely important, but there are some sites that are really small. They have no on-site people to help out. Um, there's all kinds of scenarios out there. The most important thing is that there's a lot of features. You have your set of requirements, and you should meet them all. You should meet them all. There should be no compromise when it comes to meeting all your requirements. They're all important, whether it's tracking, whether it's automation, whether it's notification, whether it's making sure that your, 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 your system is able to keep up with the changes in your environment. I think one of the most common things people forget is what you have today is going to change at least five times, ten times in the next few years. And you want to have a solution that as soon as you switch something out, you replace something, you upgrade something, you update a feature, it doesn't break everything else. That's, that's really the key. And to do that, you need to have a platform that's extremely flexible and that's future-proof. So in terms of features, um, they're all important. And I also agree about the professional services. Uh, you, need, you need to pick a vendor that invests in the right people, in the right talent, to make sure that when you deploy your solution, they're there to help you. They understand your environment, when you're talking about your network, when you're talking about your security, you, the people understand what you're talking about. They're able to help you in the pre-sales, post-sales, and the support as well. That's what's going to make and break your project. Great. Thanks very much. Nick, finish up. Yeah, just to uh, back up what uh, most of the other people said here, hands down, emergency on-site notification is, uh, is a great feature. Uh, many of our customers have told us that, you know, that's going to save them two to three minutes in emergency response time, which is a big, big deal when someone's having a medical emergency. Obviously, location discovery, automated location discovery is very important um, because that is going to free you as an administrator from having to track where these phones are. And you want, that ac you want that information to be absolutely dead on accurate. And then I think the third thing that, that, that's very important these days is the ability to you know, send a 911 call to the cloud and have it routed to any one of the you know, 6,000 plus PSAPs in the US and PSAPs in Canada. So you know, your ability to be able to send those calls to one spot and have them routed to anywhere in the country you know, anywhere in North America is, is a huge feature. Great, thanks very much. Our fifth question, back to Bill. What's your view on location reporting granularity? And I'm talking about specifically to public safety. Well, we, again, we've been doing this since 1997, so I'm not gonna drill that into you one, I mean, ever again, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, we've seen we've seen huge deployments, 10,000, 20,000 locations, to the desktop. I mean, come on, to keep that data secure, to keep that data updated. To, I mean, we had to reinvent what it means to do database management on an ongoing, circular basis between our clients and and our data centers. As IP started to roll out a few years back, we saw a really great opportunity to make the simplicity or make the job of keeping track of data, especially on your side, that much easier through the granularity of using the subnets or the ELAN EARL pairs. That really is cool because 
I mean, Communication Manager has that built in already, and you've got network maps already built in. Uh, Nortel's got the ability to do CLID uh, pr programming as well. So when it gets down to granularity, I go right back to the NINA model standard, which is 7,000 square feet, give or take, you know. It, and in essence, what, we, what you're looking at is the ability to get granular to the PSAP to the point where the dispatcher can dispatch to the right address, the right building, the right floor, and more than likely the, the, the right quadrant within that floor. And then that's, that goes without saying, to, but to get to the, to the actual cube number, to the actual desk, is irrelevant to the dispatcher because really they don't know what that means. Even the people who are arriving on scene, they don't know what that means. So in conjunction with the granularity to the PSAP of what I just mentioned, on-site notification enhances that so the first responders that are trained employees can easily meet those. Uh, um, Thanks, Bill. Okay. <laughs> Come to our booth. <laughs> <laughs> Lev, location granularity in public safety. Um, I think it's a really good question. Um, you should be as granular as you possibly can. Um, it's not a question of going, obviously going to the room level is a challenge. If you have that information, you should use it. Um, I know we have customers, uh, especially large universities, um, large uh, organizations that have their public safety that's servicing just their campus. So it is still a FCC registered PSAP. They're the security team. They're not getting screen pops. They're actually getting 911 calls going there. They need to have the room information. Usually they're familiar with the environment. Now if you're a private enterprise and you don't have the PSAP serving just your organization, in that case you don't need to go down to the room. They probably wouldn't know how to get to, your, to that room. But they would know, need to know the floor for sure. I mean if the FAR is on the 11th floor versus the first floor, that does make a difference. Um, they need to know the part of the building. If you're a multi-campus building, the, the building information is very important. Um, so that's really, it, whatever you can deliver to the PSAP, it's ideal. Keep in mind, that doesn't take away the requirement for location tracking. Your internal security team might still want to be interested to know where the call is coming from, which room. So you still have that requirement of tracking down the phones. If it's possible, get it. But then if you want to share it to the PSAP, that depends on what's useful or not. Most of the time, the more information, the better. You can't go wrong with giving more information to the PSAP. Great. Thanks very much. Nick. Um, you know, the NINA, the NINA standard really provides all of the, uh, the format that you need to define locations inside the enterprise. You know, you have 20 to 40 extra characters that you can use to define the location of the user inside the building. So, I mean, th those 20 characters can easily be constructed to do floor, building, room, information within them. So, the standard is already there. If you follow the standard, you'll have no problem defining your locations down as granular as you want. The real question that you'll have to deal with is, how granular do I want to, to go? Is, the more granular you go down to the desktop, means the more data that you're going to manage. Great. Thanks very much. Tim. Yeah, I, I, Nick nailed it. You know, it's uh, how, much, how much information you want to have and how much work do you want to do uh, and how much is really required. Obviously, the, uh, the more granular you get, uh, the more detailed you get in your location discovery, um, obviously, the closer you're going to get to the victim when they're dialing 911, and that is important. However, the question is, you know, uh, the view on location reporting granularity of public safety. And again, Nick uh, had mentioned, you know, a certain number of characters that you include in that NINA format, uh, formatted data that will help uh, some PSAPs, but not all. Um, you use uh, the, the, the example in your podcasts uh, quite frequently about, you know, cubicle 2C321. That's a lot of detail, but you know, for the firefighter who's rolling up to this facility for the first time is not going to have a clue what 2C means, let alone 321. And uh, it, it could be helpful data, it could be you know, not helpful data. So uh, there's a lot of things to look at. Granularity and emergency on-site notification within the facility and the level of granularity you're providing to the PSAPs and how much money you want to invest in the upkeep of that data that's being presented to the PSAPs on a regular basis as well. 
Lev also mentioned some of the higher education sites where they are their own primary PSAP or they're a secondary PSAP for their own on-campus um, emergencies and 911 calls. And we do deal with a number of higher education facilities. And they have um, uh, some of those same issues where they're concerned about um, they want to get down to the room level for dormitories, if possible. You know, but you also have a lot of students that are using cell phones these days, so that makes it a little more difficult. But uh, even in those cases where they are a full PSAP and they do have a full CAD program and they're responding and answering real 911 calls like a legacy PSAP would, uh, there's still a limited amount of data that, in their opinion, you know, is coming across in those alley dips. So being able to provide the additional screen pops like we do for facilities like Princeton University, as an example, or the United States Senate, who has their own uh, police department, we're able to provide a lot greater detail in those on-site notifications and in our databases. To get Great. Closer Thanks to very much. So we have a little bit of time. Any questions from the audience? Who was first here? There we go. There you go. Hi, I'm Stephanie Venerick. I'm the Director of Communications Technologies for the City of Seattle. Currently, we provide the, uh, the building, the floor, and the telephone number, the actual telephone number of the person who's called 911. We're going voice over IP. We've recently done uh, RFI, talked to a lot of you guys. But prior to doing that, I actually talked to the head of 911, our fire department, and kind of nonchalantly brought up the whole Earl Elan thing. They're not excited. They want to get that exact phone number. And I know you all say you're in Nina, and I couldn't go to the Nina conference. What kind of education is Nina doing to the, I mean, the people taking the phone call level? Because they're, they're not excited about this. And we're going in that direction. Lev. Thanks. A very good question, and I know that dealing with a lot of PSAPs, they face that dilemma. They, the whole concept of an Elin and an Earl is basically a patch. That's how I see it. It's been created because people had to provision a phone number and a record in the 911 in a static 911 database that takes three or four days to you know upload into the system. So that's what people have been using, and one of the ways the that most of the vendors use is that they map all your phone numbers to a location, all your devices, and, they, and during a 911 call, they swap out the real phone number with an emergency location identification number and present it to the PSAP so they can pull up the, the floor that has a static location. And that's, that's fine, but it does create a lot of problems. I know in, in, in California, we had actually some feedback about uh, PSAPs complaining about that. So that's why we developed a solution that allows us to preserve the phone number with a 911 call. So even though we're mapping users to locations, we're maintaining their, their, their callback number during a 911 call. That's possible when you use SIP. The reason it's possible is that SIP allows you to put additional information in the SIP headers. You can deliver location data and callback number as separate fields. When you're using the PSDN number, you have one key for the callback number and the same key for the location record. And that's why most of the legacy systems have been forced to do this mapping. And we don't think this is convenient for the PSAP because when you're gonna confirm the callback number with the call taker, the call taker has no idea what their ELIN is. They have absolutely no clue and, and it just doesn't make any sense. If you're traveling around, you preserve your phone number, just like when you have a cell phone, right? Just because I came to Boston, when I dialed 911, it's not changing my area code to Boston area code, it's preserving my cell phone number when I travel. Same thing with uh, voice over IP phones. It preserves the callback number. It's possible to do that. Great, thanks very much. Nick. Well, <clears throat> you know, the whole e er Earl Elin concept was developed really to accommodate voice over IP phones, right? So that you could move a phone from one area to another area, it would automatically register, and an administrator wouldn't have to be involved. I mean, that's, you know, from the TDM world, right? You would have to make every change on every move in the PBX, put the location information in there, send it off to the PSAP. If you set up Elins and Earls, once it's set up, people can move anywhere, and the system automatically knows where they are, so there's no administration involved. So you can go down to the desktop, but you're gonna be doing layer two network discovery, meaning you're gonna be assigning a location 
for every port on every layer two switch that you have in your network, and you're going to have to maintain that map. That will get people down to the desktop. That, the, that emergency responder will see, you know, building, floor, room, cubicle, whatever, wherever that cable terminates on that layer two port switch. Thanks. Tim. I think it was a great idea that you got your 911 people involved in the discussion. You know, I think that uh, going back to the earlier question about one of the primary challenges of a PBX administrator is know what your needs are, know what your requirements are, and then develop around that. Um, different PSAPs are going to have different requirements. Some of them are going to say, we want the room level, especially when you're talking about higher education, you're talking about, you know, those kind of facilities. They want to get down to the cubicle level. There are going to be a lot of them, though, that are going to come back to you and say, that's irrelevant. We need to know what door to get to, what building to get to, and what, maybe what floor, you know, and let the on-site notification, you know, from there uh, uh, detail out exactly where those colors are. So it, it really is going to depend upon your environment. It's going to depend on the public safety people in your area. Sometimes it's as simple as the floor plan uh, that the, the fire uh, uh, safety officials had already, you know, approved for your facility. So um, you're going to run into a lot of different responses when you're dealing with the PSAPs on what the requirements are and what they want to see. And I think it's very important that you communicate with them. Um, we've had several conversations with PSAPs across the country, and we are working with several of them uh, directly uh, to help in county government environments to, to actually deploy our on-site notification solution within the PSAP to help them better monitor their own county facilities. Okay. So, you know, you've got some, uh, again, different variances of uh, requirements that are going to be needed in your environment. And I think any time uh, you're looking at a large-scale 911 deployment, it's very important to get your local public safety officials involved to find out what their requirements are and what their needs are. That will help you define your requirements, and then you can move forward better from there. Great. Thanks. And hey. just to answer your question. You missed one. Oh, I that's right. You cut the guy off. You forget to let him answer. I mean, well, I'm taking time off for all. When you just went go over. to his booth. He'll be fine. He'll be all right. Yeah, come come to the booth. What's the me. number for 911? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Bill. No, uh, I want to answer this because uh, honestly, we really do need to communicate with Nina. Really does need to educate the community here, but also the community, the PSAP community, because in reality. Uh, I think all of what was said here makes a lot of sense, but when we really get right down to it, what will get to the what will get first responders, public first responders, to the victim as quick as possible? And it's a combination of what you do internal to the organization, and what the PSAP dispatcher will dispatch to. So, um, I I I still believe that the Nina uh, legislation for 7,000 square feet is good. It 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 actually makes it simpler for you guys as administrators to, as, as Nick had mentioned, port level identification on, a, on, on your network maps. Yeah, right? Okay, so anyway, um, that's my answer. Nina's got to get involved in, educate, in education, and I think they're doing a, an excellent job, but they've been concentrating more on the network side, cellular, uh, voice over IP providers, uh, they need to really concentrate on the MLTS uh, marketplace because they've they have not done a they've done a, a pretty good job, but they haven't really pushed as much as they could. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Actually, I'd just just like to add a little bit on that. Just from going through that and having we have a large network with uh, multiple sites, and uh, I think the the best answer to what you're saying is if, if you've got, like we do, we have uh, over 11,000 extensions and only 4,000 use DIDs. So you can't, you just, oh. you can't do what they want in that respect. And we've got extensions that cross multiple floors. So you assign a number to one, you know, you, it, you just come up with multiple problems in, in that scenario. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. Who else had a question? Hi. Um, actually, in, again, in response to your, um, your question, a lot of my entire sales organization has individual 800 numbers, so if the PSAP said, what's your callback number, they're going to rattle off some 800 number anyways. They don't know their DID. But I was also wondering, you said the legislation 7,000 feet. I thought it was bigger than, slightly bigger than that. Is that new or? 
7,000 square feet. What's, what, as we talked about before, is that like Chicago is 40,000, or Chicago, Illinois, 40,000 square feet. Uh, Washington State, it's uh, 15,000, I think, or something. It's, it's escaping me, but it's large. Um, 25,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's crazy. Again, we need the FCC to come in, just like the Telecom Act of 96, where they threatened to do something to, to allow competition, open competition on, on the local side. The FCC has to do the same thing. And I don't, I don't say that because, you know, we want you guys to do 911. It's the right thing to do within your organization. That's, that's one thing. But to try to standardize or to try to, to make it a possibility for you have a, you have a, 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 a solution that's contiguous throughout every state that you happen to be in, it's crazy because the legal, the, the, your legal staff will get involved and they might say, well, it has to be approved to or the, the PBX has to be capable of. Well, man, there's a lot of wiggle room in that too. So anyway, that's the model legislation is 7,000 square feet. In this state? No. As well, the model legislation actually is fire alarms. Excuse me? Model legislation is fire alarms. Okay. But that's okay. I'm st I've standed. I'm, 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 I'm corrected. I wrote it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions over here? What I want to do is I want to give people time to wrap up. Um, and based on time, we'll give everybody three minutes to make a final closing statement. And we will start with uh, start with the guy that I dissed earlier. Okay. Bill? Yeah, thank you. And don't forget to include your booth number. <laughs> Karina, what is that? <laughs> OK, um, 911 ETC, I mean, we've been doing this forever. Well, almost like, it seems like forever. but. 911 has been our application that we've been providing to MLTS clients for a long, long time. We've always been in the cloud. We've always been a hosted solution. We've always been a service provider. We've always been a database management company. We've always had people behind our technologies as we've evolved through TDM, through IP, both on the, IP, on the enterprise side but also on the network side, as Nick had mentioned before. Everything is in the process of evolution in that the network itself is moving from a PSTN network to a SIP-based network. Internal to the enterprise, SIP is really becoming, or IP connectivity is becoming a norm. MPLS connectivity is just, it's, it's moving through, through every one of probably your organizations. So if we apply what we've learned over the years our, our own operations team connections to the ILEX, to the ILEC connections, or to the ILEC 911 departments, and those people that run those departments, that, that kind of history, that allows us the ability for, for an implementation to go as smooth as possible in a PS Alley environment, and then overlay that wherever we need to, or utilize it as a, as a um, as our primary vehicle for database management as well as ongoing transactional 911 calls, the IP VPC network, which again, come to our booth and we'll explain what that means. So tying all of this together, 911 ETC, a service provider, pulling all of the pieces together so that we provide a one point of contact, uh, throat to choke, but a one point solution that overlays virtually every p possible uh, uh, need that you might have. Thank you. Very good. Thanks very much. Lev. Yes. I think uh, Avaya customers are very lucky to have uh, so many 911 vendors to choose from. Um, the challenge is choosing one that meets your requirements. And I know that there's a lot of requirements. Somebody mentioned about the PSAP saying they want to get their DID. Somebody else is a call center. They have toll-free numbers. Everybody has a different, different set of requirements. And the challenge is meeting all of these and not saying no, not saying I can't do it, not saying because my 911 vendor can't support me. You need a solution that 
doesn't need to compromise on anything. And, and that's where, um, that's, that's what you need to look at. Um, one, one of the things that I think differentiates us from everyone else as well is that we have cloud-based solutions and on-prem-based solutions. Each so thing tries to solve different, different problems. So sometimes you may want to go with a cloud-based solution only. Sometimes you might want to go with just an on-prem solution to solve a specific problem. And sometimes you need to do both. And the key is that if you're only a cloud-based provider, your sales team is going to be pushing cloud-based solutions all the time, even though you don't need it. If you're an on-prem solution provider, you're always going to be pushing your on-prem solutions rather than something that works best maybe in the cloud. So the key is sometimes having a hybrid solution, one or the other, and to pick a vendor that's able to provide both aspects, they control both, we, someone that controls both, both parts of the puzzle and can provide the necessary pieces to solve your problems. Great, thanks very much. Nick. Uh, Red Sky has um, a history of leadership in uh, E911. Um, in 1999, we launched our first application, E911 Manager. We're now on version six of that, which is a Java Linux application that can be deployed in your enterprise virtually. Uh, or, as I mentioned, we also announced that we're launching that. It's now available as a cloud-based service. Uh, we were the first company to offer Layer 2 Network Discovery, uh, integrated with Avaya platforms in 2005. Um, so we have a history of leadership and technology leadership in the industry. One of the things that I think that differentiates our company from some of the other companies up here is our belief in a tight integration between our application and the call server or the PBX. To leverage the capabilities that are inside the PBX, use that as, as a data store where necessary, use that as an, as an event generator where necessary, uh, which allows us to work in tandem very closely uh, with the PBX and call server so that you get a truly automated solution that's going to meet emergency notifications, network discovery, calls to the cloud, et cetera. So our products are, are compliance tested with Avaya, they're compliance tested with Cisco, compliance tested with Siemens, and that's been our philosophy since we launched our product in 99. Thanks very much, Nick, appreciate it. Tim, closing comments. Since 1987, Conveyant has been, pro uh, been providing location management applications to our customer base um, all over the world. You know, we've got 6,000 installations globally with our uh, management product, our directory management products, and in the past several years, we have embarked on the 911 trail. There is no compromise, um, like Lev said. There, there can't be a compromise on 911 or public safety. Our, our goal is to continue to educate the enterprise, um, teach you about 911, teach you about the issues about 911, teach you about what your options are, and educate you about what the capabilities you've already invested in within your call server environment today. You have a lot of inherent capability within your PBXs now. Um, some of it may be sufficient for what you're trying to do. It may be you know, falling short in a few areas uh, that you need to embellish upon or you need to add on, and that's what Conveyant provides. We provide the uh, location discovery down to the port level if required. We provide the on-site notification. We provide the automation of database information into our application to enhance that location data. When it comes to uh, requirements for customers that need to have uh, rerouting of calls or uh, repositioning of calls in their network uh, due to VPN, um, you know, home-based users or mobile users, then we partner with uh, companies such as 911 ATC in order to be able to provide that facility. That way the customer gets to build the solution that they need um, within their budget and only deploy what is necessary in order for them to meet their specific needs for 911. We do believe in that tight integration with the call servers. We um, have our own very robust lab environment, have been working very closely with Avaya and Nortel over the years. Avaya OEMs some of the conveyant 911 solutions for their wireless LAN uh, customers today, so we can provide real-time location data about sets as they are mobile within the customer's wireless LAN environment. And we continue to work with our customers and our client base and closely with Avaya to continue to develop the solution that is best for you. But number one key for us is education. Letting you understand you know, uh, what, you, what you have out there, what the uh, products are and the tech, uh, technology that is available out there for you today and designing the solution that is best for you and most affordable for you 
and not paying exorbitant costs um, for 911 that we have seen, you know, over the past decade. You know, it's time to change the standard of 911. It's time to redefine, you know, what is uh, happening in the 911 industry and get these costs down to a place where the enterprise can afford it, especially in these tight economic times, and deploy what you really need in order to solve your problems. Great. Thanks very much. So I think this has been a, a great opportunity. I was very happy with this event uh, when we did it in the fall in Newport. And again, I want to commend all of these folks here. You have to realize four companies that are competitors to each other got together today and presented their story to you on the same stage. And the reason behind that is because each one of these folks believe that 911 is critical, 911 is important, and that something needs to be done at the enterprise level. My role is to still push this through at the federal level with Nina, and I think you made an excellent comment on, uh, on education at public safety. And I've raised that several times, and we'll continue to do that in the future. So again, I'd like to give a round of applause to everybody here. My blogs and podcasts, woo, almost fell off the stage there. Um, published weekly, a lot of good information. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>